All right, T two one in favor of BLG. We see the Callista Renata pairing again. We're gonna see this combination try to take the most out, but um, but we see in response, right? We talked about Nautilus being banned by T one, saying that they were more likely to want to take Senna with Nautilus, or that enemy teams might only take Senna with Nautilus. Uh, and not with Tom Kench, but they end up passing it. They go for the Callista Renata lane. We see Senna Nautilus as an answer. Tristana being used against Akali. Now, Akali early actually does a deceptive amount of damage with physical, right? She It's all magical damage, but she's getting in those extra attacks, right? She's parking off every single one of those as an extra 60 damage. Tristana getting that extra buff to her armor means that she can get a little bit uh, better of these trades off. Also, when she can go for this highly, highly bullying level two and three spike that Akali basically just has to E away from or use her shroud to get herself into safety so she can't get attacked. That's going to be her counterplay to play against the bomb from Tristana. We'll see what kind of adaptations come from that. Xin Zhao being used as a complement to Akali and Zack means we have a super low range team comp, which is not something that we ever see from T1. Hold on, we see On and Elk actually moving in for an invade, invading before the lane swap, which is one of the best techs that you can get off if you can do it safely and you know you can, because why not? right uh if you're going to be strong on that side of the map the problem can be if the enemy team snuffs out that it's actually 3v3 then you're talking about a champion that doesn't have a good starting item right the support items are not good for early combat and and neither are the jungler items right if you can get into a position where you're like okay i can move a kalizak over into this spot and with xin Zhao, who's got one of the best level ones in the game can we actually take this fight Chances are probably not because Akali and Zach are that weak, which is probably what incentivizes this whole play to begin with. Uh, but it's interesting to see that dynamic, right? How much can you get off if you're going to be strong and if you're going to play strong side map flipped sort of interactions, then why not also mess with the jungler start? And you see Jinja being completely pushed off his normal start. Uh, working on his third camp. So Nidalee, did Nidalee steal or we just see that, is that ward just covering the Raptors? It looks like the ward is just covering the Raptors. So he's got three camps. He's going to be level three. He's got red buff for himself. So he's making an adaptation saying, I want to go dive this bot lane. Let's go. We've got red for a short amount of time. Let's see if we can kick this guy's butt. Uh, oh, this is a mistake. You don't want to do this. All right. Caria drew, drew that minion. This is worth talking about just for a moment, guys. When you're setting up this dive, it is very important that you do not draw this minion aggro, right? Because if you do and it pulls over, you're gonna see a line of scrimmage that looks like this, melee's casters, and these become impossible to kill. Your, your own melee line is gonna have to step forward and start taking turret shots, which is the opposite of what you want. What you want to do is get this line of scrimmage here with casters here where you're able to fight this wave down outside of the turret range where your melees are able to fight forward and continue hitting without getting hit back. You do that, you stack up this wave, this guy doesn't get access to any minions, and then you can go in with 3-3-3, three, 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 and you go in 9 versus 1 in total levels, and you try to kick this guy's butt, bury him from the game, force him to use his teleport to come back, and maybe even do it again. Uh, but this little take, right, when you pull this aggro, watch where the line of scrimmage is going to be drawn now. See how the minions come out? These casters... They do go just far enough, maybe, where it's not going to be the end end of the world, but that is going to be some amount of attacks. Hold on. Three versus two. Zach versus Senna being left alone here. Nautilus going for a teleport to try to hold on to this, dissuade the push. They may just go for plates and cheaty recall. This is, this is plan B. If the dive is not going to work and the tree of plays that come from the dive, then you want to go plan B, which is, okay, we have a super stacked wave. What's the next best thing we can do? Uh, invade with Pryo and and get plates, right? And you're going to try to go for as much of that as possible. Xin Zhao actually going for his own Raptor camp, Nidalee responding in turn, saying, let me go get your uh, Gromp spawn and playing for that side of the map. Now, this is gonna be slightly disjointed, right? A 340 kill means that it's not gonna be up until 555, so right before the Gromps are spawning, and that's going to affect Zinja's ability to be level five. He should be okay to get level five still, uh, based on three camps. No, with, with the Raptors and the Scuttle, he should be okay to get that spike, but he's gonna be a little bit further away now because he's only gotten four basic camps plus the Scuttle. 
Nidalee taking away both these camps because of that invade means that she's going to be strong. And that's where you, where you want Nidalee to be, right? In the constant invade mode, uh, seeing how, how strong can you get this champion in the early game. Oh, beautiful hit. Nice little combo. Do we flash forward? Yeah, we got flash. She's got the hunting ability. The zoning spear, by the way. Oh, doesn't go for that attack. The extra regen there from the Doran shield and the low health second wind. Revitalized combo there from Zach being enough to keep him alive. That is flash down from Nidalee to, to no gain. That's a, that's a big loss in tempo. That's a tool that you want for, for her to be able to get back in and out of fights. I thought that that Q was going to be a zoning Q, allowing her to step forward and get an auto attack off. The fact that Zach healed up as much as he did meant the attack wasn't going to be lethal, but it might have been enough with the red buff, just enough to get it off. So uh, I'm surprised that she didn't go for more there. Here we see the interaction of Akali into Tristana and Senna saying, hey, I'm just going to go invisible make it so you can't hit me anymore. Good job by Elk getting the most amount of stacks there. And we see, we see the difference in the amount of stacks that they're getting, right? Already 17 stacks on the on the side of this Senna. I don't know how much of that is Zeus's fault. He did go for that big trade. He did he was able to trade back fairly well, but if it comes at the cost of an early uh 20 stack, then it's not worth. Ooh, flashing out. I don't know that there's actually any threat there. So Elk's flash will be on cooldown. Knight trying to be aggressive, jumping forward. We do have the red buff from Nidalee, who has uh Hmm. How did we get another red buff? Was this just a delay on her own side? Clearing, clearing right to left, raptors respawn. Yeah, I guess this is just uh, the delay on the, on her own red. Being able to go for that invade was allowing that red to stick, and, stick for her for longer. But that should be dissipating soon. All right, level six from Guma. Actually matching the solo laners in levels is fairly significant here. You see the counterpart, Elk is only on three. So, uh, you know, trading a lot of that XP, the fact that they got pushed out of lane, but they do have all those stacks. We'll see if they can use it, but no flash, no heal means that Guma is very, very susceptible to any amount of diving. We'll see if T1 reads that and gets a playoff. Now, Void Mites are the better prize than Dragon. T1 looks like they're going for this Dragon here, but they are going to... How much are they going to lose in exchange for it? If it's Void Mites, it's not worth. They lose all presence in the river. They do get the Dragon for themselves. It takes forever, but they do get it. Is there going to be an invade to go back? You need to also get like a buff plus a second set of spawns or something here. All right, Faker, are you trying to use the E? Knight trying to take this to the maximum. Every single attack that you can, you see the spacing, always trying to get into attack range, trying to play this range. Your attack is slightly outranging the Akali Q. The Akali Q, for those of you who aren't aware, is shaped like this. And that means that these corners are actually slightly longer range. So if you wanna hit a target, you're actually better off throwing here than throwing here. Right, because this range, this this one is actually longer than what you get in the middle. You can try to trade off with some of the lower range mages, um, the, the like 525s of the world. But you can see that at that window, it's still going to be Tristana favored, especially when you have that attack speed bonus going where you can get the attack off and not take the not take the Q retaliation. But that is the, the knife's edge that they play on. Hold on, Nidalee going forward. Get a couple attacks off. This is a ghost from from Cassante trying to hold him in place with the all out. Still not enough. Zeus surviving again in this situation. So doing a good job surviving for himself. He took the Senna down to the limit. Also surviving two of these ganks. Nidalee is starting to get a little bit thirsty the way she does. And we're going to see if we get this first kill. We, we love the itemization early Sork Shoes into Hextech Alternator. This is the inverse of the AD carry itemization where it tries to abuse the Kerchus Shard and the extra damage that you're getting from the Electrified attacks. You're basically doing the same thing with the Hextech. Uh, this is the best for early short trading patterns, right? Now, positions of strength, the, the team comps. We're not, like we said, super low range. We are diving, diving, 
short range peel short range peel backline flank they're trying to make a fight happen and every time that they go they have to commit full throttle because if it breaks down into tristana and senna getting auto attacks off then it's going to be very difficult for them to consolidate any amount of hp lead that they start with especially with the extra heals coming from both of these sources now it's going to be very difficult to get through this vanguard right these two together and the fact that you're going to have tristana always threatening turrets on the side lanes plus the ability to reposition themselves in fights uh, means that the team comp should favor blg by a lot it's going to be really hard for t1 to get these fights it's going to be on the back of owner who was sort of blank in game three if we're being honest and what we need from him is to be assertive right i'm not going to say proactive but assertive the plays that you make need to compound and they need to have momentum and they need to make sure that they follow through because if it's if it's flaky or if you're just waiting the longer this game goes the more it's going to favor the senna tristana combination now the fact that you do have 280 carries means that you do have the potential for a level 11 renata ult to be completely game changing uh, this is a champion that is completely different once you get to that point pit fights start favoring favoring you in a major way uh, you'll you'll probably see that this BLG squad is going to look to not be in that spot. Hold on. Big Chomp gets the Electrocute off. Nice job by Figure to avoid any more. Good job using the Shroud there. All right, rotations. Senna and Nautilus look like they're splitting up. Nautilus is going to be alone for a bit, farming up against the Zac, saying, okay, you know, like, you're just fine. We, we don't like the Zac versus Cassante matchup as much. We want to have Cassante plus Senna, right? And this makes a lot of sense. Cassante, you want the stronger of the two members, if you can. They're both re relatively similar, but Cassante is going to be a little bit tankier with that Spectre's Cal. Interestingly enough, going with the Merc Treads into Spectre's Cal... Not mitigating that much of the damage on the enemy team. We'll see if that becomes a problem for him. Uh, or if he's just saying like, yeah, I'm not really scared of those champions anyways. But if we get Lethality coming through from Callista, which I believe we saw a serrated Dirk, right? Uh, we'll have to take a peek as soon as we get a chance. No, we're going into, into Bork builds. So we'll be okay. Uh, Bork... Bork is going to deal a significant chunk of damage to Cassante, but those upfront like chunks from Q chunks uh, not going to be as impactful against against someone who otherwise could have been by stacking MR. All right, one and a half gold uh, gold lead here. Nautilus using his Q in turret range, kind of surprising. Takes a big chunk of damage there, showing how strong Nautilus is. By the way, remember this was a top laner, guys. This was a top laner for a long time. Has spent two different iterations in pro play as a top lane. Uh, juggernaut uh, in the picks safe wave clear it literally can do it all has a perfect kit Xin Zhao with the steel right here but at what cost uh, is it none are they really just not prepared for this play they were not prepared for it okay clean steel that is huge for T1's scaling chances uh, Dragon Soul is probably a mandatory part of, of their game plan they need to look for these fights in the middle game. The 20 to 30 minute mark is going to be theirs. They should be stronger as and as long as Nidalee doesn't get oppressively big. Uh, she might be. She's trying to fast stack this companion. Get it down to zero as quickly as possible. It looks like hasn't found the first two kills and is now just on a mission to get that set up so that she can have the red buff, right? You know, Basically constantly having access to those extra slows and chunk damage for the short trades so wind becomes lightning to the edge i eh, you know today i learned that zinja can jump that far i wouldn't have expected that he could jump that far and i bet blg didn't think it either but on the tip of the range there maybe i maybe could have gone even further i guess you know we'll have to we'll have to test and see all right tristana always going to be free pushing against akali uh, Akali, with the helps to her energy, has a much better laning phase than she had, but still not going to be enough to stop Tristana from completely bullying her. She's going to try to keep it at this 20 CS deficit, though, saying that I've got enough kill pressure, especially once we hit level 11, where I don't need to be as afraid of you for as long, uh, and trying to play for it, trying to play for that spike. Still 0-0, zero, zero, 1k in the lead for the Nidalee comp makes sense. 
But Senna, 43 stacks, moving along. Not the most we've ever seen, but it's doing fine. Those tanks, man. They get so big in these, in these games. Just, you know, getting all those grass procs off against each other. Trying to get as big as they can for later in the game. But you see them, right? They're always testing each other. They're chipping each other whenever they can. If they can find any short trade that's profitable, they're going to do it. All right, mid lane prio going to the side of BLG. They get the first move, but we see this ward here. This is something that you're going to want to spot out. Uh, you want to always know when you're scouting, and this is the, the role of the advanced scout. We've spoken about this before, but you should have a coach that is watching your next opponent, always, right? Whoever your next opponent's game is going to come from, you should have somebody watching that game so that you have an idea already, a day early, what are they doing? right let your let your players and the coaches that need to focus on this game focus on this game let someone else go ahead and say at this time on this timer they put this ward down they had this draft they banned these things against the, those champions you just want to have a report already written about which wards they like to place do they like to place for example a ward right here or do they like to place it here and knowing those things and preparing your team for uh those small iterations those undulations that you can make and adjustments you can make within a game can be the difference between giving away a kill or sneaking a kill like we saw against faker right i d i could not believe that he went for the same play twice in the tournament right using his ear sneaking around here and the fact that you have a thin model means that you don't get spotted by the by the turret and using that avenue to get a ward down well you know what g2 did they they put one guy two guys right here they fought for the bush a, uh, and Azir tried to come around and they four man ganked him. They just sat in their own side of the map knowing where he was going to go and they positioned themselves to punish it. And that's what the advanced scouts are going to try to do for your team and why it's so important to have it. You want to know the tendencies. You, you'd like to get a report on like everything that they've done over a long period of time and you might have to compile sort of a database for your opponents. Like this is what this team does. This is what they do time and time again again pretty soon we'll have ai that'll be able to just get that all for you if these teams haven't developed it for themselves anyways to just create a report and be like here's the heat map of all the wards this team has placed and at what time and you can scale it based on what time in the game that you know if i'm running a team that's one of the projects i want i want programmers that are able to map that out for me that are able to sort of predict and come to insights that we might not be able to see as humans, but the computer will say, hey, like they placed this ward in 17 of 17 games, or we, they placed this ward in 30 of 17 games, right? Or they placed 30 of these wards. They just love this exact same spot. And that, that can be something that can be exploited. Game theory says that in one game scenarios where you just need to win one game, you just want to exploit in the hardest way possible. If someone makes a slight mistake, you should adjust hard in that direction to exploit it to the maximum. And if you can get it in these one game series, right? Let's say it's game five or an elimination game. If you can get that window off for yourself, sweet, right? Like there's nothing better than, than to feel like you've earned a free win uh, just off of prep. Sometimes, sometimes it's not so free. Sometimes it takes all game but your window comes up just like Patriots against Seahawks. You train for that moment. And you're like, this is something that they might run on the goal line. And you give some players some repetitions on it. And then you get situations like the Butler did it with the pick in the end zone. All with prep. All with prep. This is something that a lot of these teams are not particularly good at. Uh, I was stoked when G2 punished T1 for, for that play. Just all prep. And it's like, okay, you like to sneak around this, this wall? All right, let's set, up, let's set up a trap. If you do it again, then we'll completely crush you. And they did. They got a free win that way. Nice engage there. This is a very tanky Nautilus. This is not support Nautilus that can be bursted down when you're going on full-scale farming right here. And this is the difference between Tom Kench and Nautilus when it comes to these lanes. Nautilus is a completely different beast and almost strictly better than Tom Kench. The one thing that Tom Kench offers you is the ability to gobble up the Senna, but in these stages, the fact that Tom Kench has so, uh, sorry, that Nautilus has so much utility means you get to go for fights like that. Super tanky, 
jumping into the middle of the fight, has two people to heal him up as well. So he can be that front man for the for these backliners to pivot off of and get the heals from the Senna and the Nidalee. It means that he's basically unkillable. BLG takes a big lead for themselves. And now with Dragon come or sorry, with Baron coming up in 30 seconds, the correct answer is going to be to ignore the side. Let's take a look at this fight for a moment. Karyo trying to go for the maximum. Guma just that should have been that should have been dodgeable. His eyes must have just not been there. But that one hook seeds everything else. And while Callista can bail out Renata. You know, Renata can kind of bail out, but not as not as hard, right? You just can't pull him off the map. Correct answer from T1 would have been to force their way into this quadrant. I do like that they have this vision for themselves on the backside. Couldn't give them a way to sneak into a fight. Although this is a control ward, so any teleport is going to reveal you here. Mid push into safe vision here. This is what you try to play for. If you're behind, you try to say, I'm gonna hold this mid push and I wanna hold my own beaches. I do not want to let you into this area. Once they get into that area, it's doomed. Because once they're in here, then you have to back off all the way to your turret on both sides, and then they can take whatever's behind it, right? So the whole defensive strategy, and it, you can use two people here, right? Put one person in the lane farming, one person in the lane, and two people in fog of war, trying to maintain that for themselves, and Akali and Callista ready to snap back at any moment. Uh, best exploit from, from the red team right there would be push for Pryo, go in with numbers, right? Bring four people, and say, I force you to go and collect the wave or come answer me, you can't do both. And I go in and when I punch, I follow through, I make it into that quadrant and I try to get lingering vision. I have to do it twice, first time to do it for myself, second time to either get it deeper or to break past your sweeping lens because you've already swept some of my wards and I need to reestablish that vision. Once you do it those two times and you can start getting your really good warding net, that's when you can start pushing for Baron Pryo. You see how confident Nautilus is. And like this position right here, like look how strong Nidalee is in this spot. She can fight over walls better than almost any other champion in the entire game. Able to poke out at distance, fight for those control wards, able to get the maximum. And uh, now you're gonna see Cassante moving over to, to the mid lane. I expect them to come back and pick up this wave because it's stacking, but I want him to come back and actually fight for this. This is tough when you have a carry style top laner. Can you actually have the patience to give up some resources to make sure that your team doesn't lose something bigger right you're going to lose 10 cs down here it's not that big of a deal all right you're they forced you into a fork and that's okay they've made a good play for themselves i need to make sure i'm not losing the bigger prize which is this mid turret i can come over later pick up the rest of the wave later and it's not so bad we haven't lost any turrets i'm gonna be okay Lovely to see this from Bin. This is a more mature player. This is a player who has adopted the reality that to win, to win on the world stage, it needs to be we, not me, right? And it's kind of ironic because I think he was let go by this franchise, right? But <laughs> the um, but still, uh, in this game, t team games, it's got to be we, not me. You've got to be able to play for what the team needs most. Now he can go up. Now that the dust has settled, the enemy team has used a couple of rotations. You can go up and take a second wave. Now he resets and he can rejoin his team by pushing into this area. Good ward spacing right here. Again, much better to put it in the river and in the junctions than in the bushes. The bushes are, are for control wards. No real reason to have a ward here when it can't spot different mobility positions. And also you're going to try to get it away from where enemy teams might have control wards. At least in the rock, paper, scissors as it stands. As teams are putting more and more control wards into bushes, that means don't put your green wards into bushes. They're going to get swept. Try to put them in a position where they're hugging a wall that won't be seen, seen by a sweeper and won't be seen by a control ward. And that way you can actually get some lingering vision, have it matter a little bit. Nidalee happily playing with this wall. She's uh, one of the few champions that is happy happy to play in the, this corridor of despair. Hold on, flash Q, Akali using RE as a combo. They get the pick onto it, but now they have no cooldowns. Do we have a continuation fight? No, they're not gonna do anything. 
Uh, so actually playing for full retreat. Nice little pick from T1. I did say that Nidalee would be very strong there, but you have to be careful when you don't have access to your jump, right? When you just jump over the wall, that's when you have to be a little bit safer. Wait to make sure that you're not getting hit in the far side. Nice job by Carrie realizing that you could flash Q right there and get her in the face point blank. And throw into the team. Nice combos from everybody. Took very good execution. Very quick timing. Uh, they were able to throw that punch and deliver, which means that their prize is going to be this dragon. <clears throat> I don't expect any answer from Bin. Bin will get to push this lane out. And we should see a fight from mid prio into topside river from BLG and see if they can control this. Again, they want to try to set up this long range sieging position where the range of the Senna Nidalee is going to favor them. They don't want to be stuck in small areas. Now that we don't have a flash from Kyria and um, that's one of, that's one of their short range like engage tools right here. So that hit reveals, boom, catch them in the auto animation. You notice how she does that? The lockout moment when someone's attacking, right? And they, they've got 0.17, one sixth of a second is their attack frame. That's your window to try to land spells. They do get the one trade back onto Xinjiao. They do get the turret for themselves. Uh, sorry, T1 gets the turret for themselves. Faker is level 15 in a position to actually run this game. Lichbane, Shadow Flame, and Sork Shoes going for the maximum amount of burst damage, saying, I want to skip over your frontliners. I don't want to play for them. I want to play for you on the back line. One pick, electrocute. That's what this entire game is going to come down to now because of this Akali build. It's going to be the ability to protect these three squishies in the back line using someone like Cassante to front or Nautilus to front and Cassante to peel and saying, hey, if you if you take the wrong dive and I'm able to peel you off as a Cassante, you are going to die. Uh, it's going to be tough for the rest of the team to follow that up, though. It's really only Zach that can that can penetrate at that range. Maybe you get a situation if you're T1 where Zach's going to jump long range and you're going to have Xin Zhao going from shorter range and Renata throwing the ultimate over the top. She is level 11, so this is a real ultimate now. All right, you can hold people in place long enough. Those two attacks is enough. Hold on, flash forward into an R. There's no way they get the rest of this, is there? <gasps> they hit the Q. Nautilus hits it from the angle. Not even lollipopping right there. Just a beautiful flash R. To connect and uh and akali's just a little bit too late a little bit too far forward and normally the steady presence for themselves no way they get another one zach's bubbles are just going to die for free here carry out also has no flash so basically has to go into a position where now Callista has to bail them out Ooh, what why did you jump forward that was I don't know what that was. I feel like that was a mistake. I can't even say that that was over ambitious or anything. That was just a blunder from T1. So making mistakes at this stage. Oh, auto cancel. All right, still enough. Cassante able to take out Callista. You wouldn't expect that to be a champion that, uh, that you can go after on a tank, but 2024, guys. I don't like that Ben stop spending any time on that on that ward, right? You don't want to spend any amount of time. Your team wants to kill this as quickly as possible and start rotating. That ward is not of consequence. There is no teleports up. You're able to keep track of these timers. There's no threat of anyone coming for you. Look at this. They so watch the channel. I talked about it that J in the game against JDG, BLG flashed the T1 emotes. And then in this game, as BLG is stomping T1, they flash JDG. Like, where are you, JDG? This is, you know, we are the true champions. Now that we, you know, thank you for night. Now we can take this team out for you. If you guys haven't checked it out, by the way, the Faker Saga, uh, this this channel's most popular series, uh, you have to check it out. This I absolutely love the story of last year's World Championships where everyone is focused in Korea of how do I beat Faker, how do I beat Faker, and you see BDD and then Showmaker and then Chovy come up and, and Zeka, and there have been these superstar mid laners, but the whole while that the story has been, can any of these guys beat Faker, all the focus has been there. You've just had this looming juggernaut building to the south in the form of the Chinese LPL and how those teams just 
came through and just got so much stronger, each of them taking out Korean counterparts. But then what was left was Faker, and it's always Faker. And he was able to chew through three Chinese teams on his way to the World Championship last year. Uh, I think it was a fantastic story. You couldn't write it up any better. And, and you know, speaking of those narratives, the way that BLG has adopted this narrative for themselves of we're going after this team, our bullseye has been set on you. We've had a poster of T1 in international events. I want to play them again so that I can beat them, so I can stomp them because we are better and they're showing it right now. This is why they took this is why PSG took them to five games because they've been focusing on this moment right here since November. I guarantee you that the past six months, these guys have thought of nothing more than getting their vengeance on T1 and and now they get it. Now the question's gonna be what happens for the rest of the tournament? T1 in the lower bracket, BLG on the top side, they still gonna have to beat Gen G. I think that this metagame is really bad for Trovi. Trovi is only finally starting to get a hold of uh, basic macro concepts that you expect at the world stage. And now everyone's throwing it for a loop with all these lane swaps. And usually that means that he might be in a position where he gets punished. Uh, but I'm going to tell you, man, these Chinese teams are coming after you. Objective number one, stomp T1 in a world stage. Objective number two, we're going to try to win this tournament now. Uh, is BLG going to be able to carry this momentum or are they just going to have a honeymoon phase where they say hey we did what we came to do and sometimes you you don't build enough past that i guarantee you that they've wanted this more than anything else in the world but now it's here they've done it you've throttled t1 3-1 by the way what's next right what can they do this team is so good knight was the perfect addition take your bows guys you deserved it this was a fantastic game to watch i hope you guys enjoyed it if you did make sure that you like and subscribe to the channel we'll be continuing to track the faker saga the bin and knight uh blg warpath and try to take down the koreans on their way to this glory road they want this guys it's going to be exciting i can't wait to watch the rest of the tournament i'll catch you guys next time keep it surreal peace